worry about what a point is in terms of a, some small little spec on the page. We're going to define what a point is purely algebraically using a prior number system. In this case, the rational numbers that we're very comfortable with, that we're going to rely on predominantly in this course. Okay, so this is a very 17th century kind of definition. We're going to define what we mean by a point in terms of an expression involving two numbers, x and y, separated by a comma, and closed in square brackets. The square brackets, that's an arbitrary choice, but that will alert us to the fact that we're talking about points rather than something else. So, for example, here is a point, point one, comma, two and a half. So those are two rational numbers. This is an affine point. Now, this point can be visualized or realized in a number of different ways. So, maybe here is my picture of the affine plane, and maybe here is your picture of the affine plane. Both of them are reasonable pictures. In both of them, we'll be able to interpret this point as being associated to a physical location on our page. So here I have my axis x in this direction, and y in this direction. This may be a little bit slanted from the usual, but that's all right. And maybe the separations along the x direction of these parallel lines isn't really the same visually as the separation in the y direction. But that's all right, too. We still have one, two, three positions marked in the x direction. One, two, three, and so positions marked on the y axis. That still allows us to locate this point. It's one over in the x direction, and two and a half in the y direction. So we go one over in the x direction, and two and a half over in the y direction, and then we go parallel to the axes, in this case parallel to the y axis, and parallel to the x axis from those coordinate positions to get at the point A. And over here is an alternate system, very similar, but just a little bit different. It looks more like a regular piece of graph paper. And here's the point A, one in the x direction, two and a half in the y direction. So we're not going to say that one of these is preferable, and maybe somebody else has a quite different affine coordinate system in which the position of A would be quite different looking. That's okay. What we're going to do is we're going to have a consistent framework in each one of these so that the statements that we make will apply equally to whatever affine framework you have. So we're giving more weight to the algebraic point of view. Right? The algebraic point of view, this expression, is the predominant definition of what a point is. That way we avoid any kind of philosophical discussion about what an, you know, an infinitely small position or point might be on the page. We just have an algebraic expression, left bracket, number, comma, number, right bracket. That's an affine point. The other fundamental ingredient is the idea of a line. For us, we're also going to rely on an algebraic orientation to define what we mean by a line. Even though we will have a physical or geometrical interpretation of that, the primary object is still algebraic, which means we can satisfied. 
So notice the use of the indices here, the x0 and y0. This is a, a kind of convention that one sometimes does, that we have these general variables x and y, which can be rather general. And when we want to refer to specific values of them, as we do here, then we're putting these indices x0 and y0 there. So these are particular numbers that are going to end up playing the roles of the x and y in this equation. So that's what it means for the point A to lie on the line L. And equivalently, we'll also say that the line L passes through the point A. And another way of saying that same relation is that we'll say that A is incident with L. That makes it kind of a bit more balanced. The point and the line are incident. Okay, so that's the crucial property that connects points and lines. Although we've defined lines purely algebraically, of course we want to visualize them as well. So we're going to do that by plotting some of the points that lie on the line on our affine plane. So here is our affine plane, or at least part of it, right? I mean, actually the thing extends or could be extended in either direction, but this is just some portion of it that we've actually bothered to write down. Okay, x-axis here, y-axis here, x-coordinates here, y-coordinates here. Parallel lines, as you can see, equally spaced. Okay, and here are two lines. The line L with the equation 3x plus 2y equals 6, that's in red, and the line M with the equation x minus y equals 1, and uh, that's in green. And let's just sort of verify that these lines contain certain points. So, let's have a look at line L. Can we find any points that lie on this line? That means we're looking for pairs x and y that satisfy the equation of the line. And that's, of course, reasonably easy to do. If we set x equal to 0 and y equals 3, then we get a point that satisfies the equation, and that's that point right there. If we set y equal to 0 and x equal to 2, we get the point 2, 0, which is right here, and that also lies on the line. This uh, suggests that perhaps this line L goes through the point 4 minus 3. How do we check whether that's true? We have a look to see whether 4 minus 3 satisfies the equation. And yes, it does. 3 times 4 plus 2 times minus 3 is indeed 6. So yes, this point here will also not satisfy that equation. But there are lots of other points that satisfy the equation. In fact, um, all of the points that you could find that would lie on this line would have that property. So if we went around and plotted a lot more points that satisfy this, we would find that they all lie on this line. This is really one of the great insights of Fermat and Descartes in the 17th century. But a linear equation like this, when you actually plotted the points, you actually do get a straight line. And crucially, it doesn't depend on having a standard Euclidean framework where you have lots of perpendicular lines and sort of equally spaced in the x and y direction coordinates. It's true even with these more general kinds of lines with a general affine plane. How about m equals for the line x minus y equals 1? Well, we can find some points on there. The point 1, 0 is on there. 1, 0 satisfies the equation. 0, minus 1 is on there. That's that point there. The point 2, 1 is on there. There it is there. The point 3, 2 is on it. There it is there. How about the point 2 and a half, 1 and a half? 2 and a half, 1 and a half. It'll still work. So that'll be uh, 2 and a half there, 1 and a half there. That'll be there. Okay. So even though we often restrict ourselves to integer values because the arithmetic is easier, we should be aware that we're really talking about rational number coordinates here. So there's lots of intermediate points that we can also uh, specify. Okay. And so all of the points on this green line, and of course extending in that direction and extending negatively as well, will satisfy the equation of this line. And conversely, uh, everything that satisfies the equation of the line will actually physically be on uh, this uh, geometrically straight line. So it's a lovely kind of basic fact that linear equations correspond to straight lines in the affine grid plane. So I'm hoping that that's pretty familiar to you. But now we want to up the ante and move to a slightly more sophisticated point of view towards points and lines, which will give us increased power in being able to make calculations. That involves harnessing a projective point of view. And the, the key technology is contained in this idea of a proportion. And we're going to be considering two kinds of proportions. So first of all, a two-proportion is an expression of the form A to B. So there's a colon here. And uh, we'll say A to B, where A and B are rational numbers, not both zero. One of them can be zero, but not both of them. And we're going to agree that there's an important convention of equality here, given by this relation here, that A to B is equal to lambda A to lambda B for any non-zero number lambda. In other words, if we take a given proportion and we multiply both of the entries by the same non-zero number, then we get an equal proportion. Okay, we're going to agree that that's what equality is in terms of these proportions. And correspondingly, we're going to go up one and consider a three proportion to be an expression of for A to B to C, where again, A, B, and C are rational numbers, and not all zero. So one of them could be zero, maybe two of them could be zero, but not all three of them, okay? And we'll have a similar kind of convention that the proportion A to B to C is by definition equal to lambda A to lambda B to lambda C for any non-zero number lambda. Okay. These ideas go back to the ancient Greeks, at least, okay? And uh, the ancient Greeks were very conscious of the idea of the relative sizes of two numbers. That's what we're getting at here. That uh, it's not really the absolute value of A or B, but the relative sizes that's captured by the idea of this proportion. In a way, it's very similar, or kind of parallel to the idea of a fraction. So the proportion A to B acts in a lot of ways like the fraction A over B. But it's crucially different in that we're not insisting that the B be non-zero. 
we weren't working with a fraction a over b, we'd have to insist that the denominator not be zero. Here we're not making that insistence. So the two sides are being treated equally. Okay. So it's a little bit like a fraction, but I want you to think about it as some kind of separate uh, object. It's a proportion. A two proportion or a three proportion. And these are uh, very, very useful ideas in mathematics, going back thousands of years. So how do we tell whether two proportions are equal? Well, one way is to see that there's a non-zero lambda that you can multiply one by to get another. But sometimes it's more convenient to have a more direct way of determining that. And that's given by this important theorem, the two-proportion theorem, which is that the proportion A to B equals the proportion C to D precisely when AD minus BC equals zero. Well, we could also say AD equals BC, but for reasons that will become clear later, we'll prefer to write it this way, that the expression AD minus BC turns out to be zero. And there's a similar kind of theorem, the three-proportion theorem that holds, that tells you when a proportion A to B to C equals the proportion D to E to F. There's a similar kind of check that involves three such expressions. The AE minus BD should be equal zero, the AF minus CD should equal zero, and the BF minus CE should equal zero. And you can think about this as sort of being three of these two proportions put together. So contained in this three proportion are really three two proportions. The first one you get by ignoring the third element, that's just that, those things there. The second one you get by ignoring the middle elements, A to C is the same as D to F. And the third one, ignoring the first uh, elements, B to C equals E to F. Okay. So these are just, these conditions apply to each one of those separate two proportions, which are contained in the three proportion. And here are some examples that you can check. 6 to 4 is equal to 9 to 6, since 6 times 6 minus 4 times 9 is 0. And here, 1 to a half to a third equals 6 to 3 to 2, since 1 times 3 minus a half times 6 is 0. 1 times 2 minus 1 third times 6 is 0. And 1 half times 2 minus 1 third times 3 equals 0. So we need to check all three of those conditions. If they're satisfied, then these two three proportions are equal. a little bit more smoothly because it actually allows us to remove denominators more efficiently and sort of replace fractional thinking with integer thinking. And it also turns out to have uh, advantages when we are working with points at infinity in sort of perspective, but that's not going to play a, a major role for us, at least initially. Okay, so the idea is that there's an affine kind of geometry and there's a projective geometry. And without worrying too much about what projective geometry is, we're just going to borrow some very key ideas from it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the two ideas that we currently have of points and lines in affine geometry and look at the corresponding way of representing those objects in projective geometry. Okay, so how does that go? So if you have a point A, which is x, y, in the affine geometry point of view, then we can rewrite it as a projective point by doing what? By considering a proportion x to y to 1, enclosed in square brackets. The square brackets are still alerting us to the fact that we have a point. But now instead of having two numbers separated with a comma, we have three numbers which are forming a proportion, x to y to 1. And now what about a line? So here's a line L in the equation form that we've introduced it as the equation AX plus BY equals C. And we've said that this equation is going to be unchanged when we, say, multiply all of the entries by some number. Well, that's very suggestive of having a proportion, in fact. Okay. And it suggests to us that we should really be thinking about the proportion formed by these three numbers rather than the three numbers themselves. Okay. So we're going to do that, but at the same time we're going to do a slight twist and we're going to move this C to the uh, left-hand side. So think about this equation as AX plus BY minus C equals zero. Think about it that way, then we can encode it by the three coefficients, A to B to minus C. And that's now a proportion. And we're enclosing that proportion in round brackets to alert us to the idea that this is a line, not a point. Points in square brackets, lines in round brackets. Okay, so let's do an example. Here is a classical affine point, point one-third, four-fifths. According to this, we can rewrite it in projective coordinates as one-third to four-fifths to one. We make the agreement that we're going to say that this thing equals this. This is a convention that we were adopting. But now because this is a proportion, we are allowed to multiply the numbers here by anything that we want to, and the proportion is not going to change. In particular, we can multiply by the, the least common multiple of the denominators here, and we can multiply by 15, essentially clearing fractions. So if we multiply all three entries by 15, we're going to get 5, 12, and 15. So the, this third 
coordinate that we're introducing, which you may think is kind of a waste of time, okay, actually performs a useful role. And it's a, a place where we can clear denominators or, or clear fractions for. So we can multiply by the uh, least common uh, multiple of the uh, denominators and therefore change what started as being a bunch of fractions or rational numbers with three integers. This is a powerful computational device because most of us prefer to work with integers rather than with fractions. But they still contain the same amount of information. If we want to go backwards from the proportion or point of view towards the point, what we just have to do is divide by this third entry. If we divide by the third entry, then that becomes a one, and then these things become the fractions uh, that determine the point. Let's have a look at an example with a line. Say the line minus 7x plus 2y equals 4. Well, if we do that, the 4 to the other side becomes a minus 4. And then we can represent this line by the proportion minus 7 to 2 to minus 4, all in round brackets, alerting us to the fact this is a line, not a point. And once we have done this, we could, if we felt like it, multiply the proportion by any number that we want to, including minus 1, to rewrite it perhaps slightly in a more nicer way as 7 to minus 2 to 4. Here's another example of the line M, which is in the form of y equals 3 over 2x minus 5. This is uh, not exactly our standard form, the same way we had here. So let's think about how we could rewrite this in standard form. Well, we could multiply, say, by 2, to get rid of that uh, denominator, it would be 2y equals 3x minus 10. And if we brought it into the one side, we'd get 3x minus 2y minus 10 equals 0. Once we have that form, we can immediately write down what the projective form of that line is. It's 3, the coefficient of x, minus 2, the coefficient of y, minus 10, the other number on the same side. So I hope you can appreciate that there's something powerful about this point of view. Because when we were talking about equations of lines, it was a little bit ambiguous, right? There were all these different possible ways of rewriting the equation, maybe with y on the left-hand side, or with x on the left-hand side, or with both of them on the left-hand side. But when we convert into this projective form, then those ambiguities mostly disappear. And the only ambiguity that's left is the fact that we can multiply all three numbers by a scalar, by a non-zero scalar. So, so conceptually, this is actually a very nice and attractive way of thinking about what points and lines are. We could have started by defining affine points and lines in this way. But we prefer to think about affine points and lines in this more traditional way, and just think about these as being alternate ways of representing them. These are the projective ways of representing points and lines. Okay, so here we come to an important formula called the projective incidence formula. So from our point of view, we are very interested in formulas. This course will be full of interesting formulas, and we think of formulas as being just as important as theorems generally. And if we can, we want to present information in the form of formulas. We feel a little bit more comfortable and confident about validating and interpreting and verifying formulas. Okay, so this is a way of thinking about what the relationship between a point and a line is, this incidence relationship, in the language of the projective coordinates. Okay, so the statement is that the point A, let's say A, a to B to C, that's the projective form of a point, is incident with the line L, which is R to S to T, so that's the projective form of a line, precisely when this relation is satisfied, when A times R plus B times S plus C times T equals zero. In other words, if we take the definition of incidence that we originally had in the affine case and convert it into this projective setting, then this is the relationship that we end up with. This is the test about whether this point and this line are incident. So, for example, we can check that the point 4 minus 3 lies on the line 3x plus 2y equals 6. We can do that directly, just by substituting this in and seeing if it works. 3 times 4 plus 2 times minus 3, yes, that actually equals 6. So, yes, this point does lie on this line. But now we can also do this using projective coordinates. Let's see how that would work. So, this point would be represented projectively as the point 4 to minus 3 to 1. That's how we go from a point in affine coordinates to projective coordinates. This line can be represented by projective coordinates 3 to 2 to minus 6. Okay. And then we can check incidence just by applying this rule. 4 times 3 plus minus 3 times 2 plus 1 times minus 6 equals, that's 12, that's minus 6, that's minus 6, so yes, we get 0. We get 0, so yes, this point and this line are incident. That's how we check that relation in the projective coordinates. So to end this lecture, I'm going to show you two very important formulas that uh, allow us to do two fundamental things that we want to do. First of all, to find the join of two points. If you have two points, how do you find the equation of the line that joins them? And then secondly, how do you find the meet of two lines? And we're going to see that this projective point of view uh, really makes this problem very interesting and attractive. Okay. So the join of the points A and B, and the point A is A to B to C, and the point B is D to E to F. This is the following line, L, which we're going to first of all write as AB. So AB means the line that joins A and B, the line that passes through A and B. And here's the formula for it, projective coordinate-wise. So it's a, a line, you can see that by the round brackets, and it has three entries. And the entries are what? The entries are BF minus CE, that's the first entry. The second entry is CD minus AF. And the third entry is AE minus BD. Now, that might look like a rather imposing kind of formula, but I do remind you that those are exactly the kinds of quantities that appeared when we were 
investigating the question of when a given three proportion equals another three proportion. So this thing here is just the second and third entries, just involving the second and third entries here and here. So we just look at B, C, and E, F, then it's B times F minus C times E. And this second entry just involves the first and third entries of both. So it's C times D minus A times F. And the third entry just involves the, the two first entries, A, B here, and D, E here. It's A times E minus B times D.